thank you everyone for joining us for our webinar today, Stress Less, Fostering Calm and Resilience in Everyday Life. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna go over a few housekeeping items. Um, so all callers will be muted. If you have questions, feel free to use the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, that's preferred for you guys to use the Q&A box so we can manage all of your questions as they come in. Uh, there is also a chat function. Um, if you want to use the chat, if you can't find the Q&A, you can use that as well. We'll be monitoring both, um, but Q&A is preferred. Um, if, if you have to drop off early or if you want to watch the webinar again, uh, we will be sending out a recording with all the relevant links once the webinar is over to your email. Uh, if you're on social media, feel free to give us a follow. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, and we actually also recently uh, joined LinkedIn. So if you're on any of those platforms, feel free to uh, give us a follow. And for those of you who are active on Twitter, we always love getting tweets during our webinar. Uh, so feel free to send us a tweet right now. We have Erica, who is our social media director um, on the webinar with us, and she will tweet back at you um, if you tweet at us. So. All right, so uh, just a quick overview on how to use Zoom. It can be a little bit confusing. Um, so if you wanna change the view um, on the top right of your screen, you should see a little button that says view and you can use either gallery or speaker. Um, it's mostly gonna be our presenters uh, mainly speaking today. So um, speaker mode should, should work just fine. Um, and then also if you wanna ask questions, again, the Q and A box, you should see it at the bottom of your screen. And that's where we ask you to direct all of your questions for the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, and then we also have a chat function if you need to um, ask us any questions throughout the presentation. All right. So just a little bit about the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program. So the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program is a comprehensive online transformation course for cancer survivors and those who seek to reduce their risk of cancer and other chronic illnesses. Um, the course is free and it's online. We highly recommend that you take the course if you get, get an opportunity. It's really rich with content. We actually moved um, to a new platform. So the user experience is very friendly and we have lots of supporting materials and it's about 10 hours worth of content. So we really um, encourage you to sign up today if you haven't done so already. And Erica will be putting that link in the chat box. Um, so if you are interested in taking the course, you can go to www.anticancerlifestyle.org. We cover the topics of diet, fitness, change, mindset, and environment. And again, it is available free at cost. Um, if you're able to make a donation, that's great. We are a nonprofit, so we do appreciate that, but we do want to make it accessible to everybody. And um, in addition to our course, we have several um, other offerings in um, including our learning circles. So learning circles happen once a month and that's really meant to kind of be a community support where you come in and you can ask any questions that you have about the module. We have webinars um, like the one that we have today. We have a toolkit. So there's lots of rich resources in our toolkit. We have a private Facebook group. So um, we really wanna be able to connect people and let people ask you know, questions to each other. So we do have a, a private Facebook community. Um, and Erica will also send that out in the chat if you want to join our community. Um, we have a blog, we have a newsletter. If you haven't signed up for our newsletter, I highly recommend doing so. Um, we include lots of helpful tips and how to's and recipes and things to kind of just help you on your journey. And we also have one to one coaching. So if you feel like you want to go deeper into any of the topics that I mentioned earlier, um, we do have experts on hand that can provide one to one coaching. All right, so I'm gonna pop open the chat really quickly. Before I make inter introductions, I just wanna make sure that everyone can hear me okay. So if you wanna type in where you're calling in from and I can read a few of those out um, just to make sure you guys can hear me. All right, so we have Denver, Austin, Calgary, Charlotte, Chapel Hill, Orlando. Okay, awesome, they're coming in fast. Uh, let's see, awesome, okay. So it sounds like you guys can hear me, okay. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and make introductions. So my name is Seema Tucker and I am the marketing director at Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program. 
Uh, with me, we have uh, Erica Crespo, who is the social media director, and she's going to be helping um, on the back end with chat. And then we also have our main presenters. So we have Dr. Lorenzo Cohen, who is the Richard Haynes Distinguished Professor in Clinical Cancer Prevention and Director of the Integrative Medicine Program at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. He is a former vice chair of the Academic Consortium for Integrative Medicine and Health and is a founding member and past president of the Society for Integrative Oncology. Dr. Cohen has published more than 175 scientific articles in top medical journals and has edited two books on integrative medicine for cancer care. We also have Allison Jeffries, M.Ed., and she has worked extensively as an educator. She is a former president of the MD Anderson Cancer Center faculty and family organization and works closely with Dr. Cohen to foster health and wellness in individuals and their communities. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Dr. Cohen and Allison. Thank you uh, team at Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program and, and thank you Meg Hirschberg for starting the program in the first place and, and having us uh, with you today to be able to go deeper into one of the areas that we call the mix of six. Yes. I add my thanks as well. And thank you so much to everybody who's joining today. We really appreciate that you're taking this valuable time to spend it with us. And I want you to take a moment to honor yourself for the last year of your life and all the changes that you have made in your home, in your household, at your job, with those that you love. It's really important to recognize all the amazing things that you have contributed to making your life successful. So we honor you and I want you to honor yourself as well. As we set forth today, because we're gonna talk about stress and trying to foster that calm and resilience in everyday life. We're gonna start with a meditation moment. So if you um, are able to, uh, to participate uh, because you're in a spot that allows, that's great. So what I'd like you to do, and I'm gonna walk you through it, is I'd like you to sit up straight if you're in a chair, uh, stand up straight if you're standing. Uh, I'm gonna want you to close your eyes and after we finished, we're gonna take three deep breaths and I'm gonna guide you through it. And after you're finished, I'd like you to keep your eyes closed for just a little bit longer after we finish. So it's really important that you take deep diaphragmatic breaths uh, to see, to make your belly move and to feel the air going all the way down your body. So we're gonna do this to center ourselves before we embark on a discussion of how to continue to do this well. Okay, so I'd like everybody to inhale, exhale. Notice how your inhale and exhale become longer. Inhale again. and exhale, trying to extend that exhale for as long as possible. Relax your shoulders. Let's do our last breath. Inhale. Now exhale. Exhaling all that air, keeping your eyes closed, just reflect on how your body feels right now from just these three simple breaths. Take your hands together and rub them to create friction and heat. Put your hands over your eyes, kind of cupping them and touch your face. Just rub your face, your shoulders and give yourself a big hug. Great. It's a good way for us to center and get started. So just to tell you, Lorenzo provides the science and I talk about strategies and how to. So today we're talking about cancer and stress and everyday life and building up that resilience. So just a little bit about us, uh, you know, our subject is cancer and lifestyle. 
and we uh, talk about a variety of different areas. And I know that uh, today we're just going to be focused on stress. Uh, Lorenzo started working at MD Anderson Cancer Center here in Houston, and he was doing research on cancer and stress. Uh, and also cancer and lifestyle. And he started coming home and we had started a family and he was bringing all this very interesting material home and we would discuss it at dinner. And what we realized was that there was this wealth of information that we could use in helping us to raise our children. And so we started practicing and doing different things in our house to help our children uh, be as healthy as possible and fill their toolbox. And what we realized was that we weren't doing the same ourselves. So we started to undertake that process by making small changes in our life and with our community of friends and started making more and more changes. And Lorenzo and I then started speaking in our community about cancer and lifestyle. And what we realized was that we had a unique perspective because of Lorenzo's experience uh, as a researcher and a scientist and mine as an educator. Uh, we decided to write a book together called Anti-Cancer Living. And so we wrote a book uh, talking about all of this stuff in a very readable manner. And on the day that we submitted our draft, uh, our final copy to the editors, uh, Lorenzo was diagnosed with advanced melanoma. And so we then started a journey that before we had been on one side of the discussion and after we submitted our book, we then found ourselves on the other side. So we've had experience as cancer patient, cancer caregiver, as well as just people trying to live as healthy a life as possible. So what we want you to uh, get from the talk today is uh, how to build a body that is as inhospitable to cancer as possible. Uh, so we hope that you find that. And here's uh, our book, um, which if you want to get more information, and we talk about six areas uh, and cover a lot of material with great resources, scientific resources in an easy to read fashion. And if English isn't your first language, it's available in over 12 different languages. So, um... so let's get into a bit of the science. We, we know how to prevent the majority of cancers in our world and a number of the uh, lifestyle and behavioral factors are shown here. And we're not gonna go into details of all of these, but the evidence is clear that at least 50% of cancer could be prevented and 50% of of cancer deaths could be prevented. And some estimate that it's probably closer to 70% from behaviors such as smoking, this area that we call energy balance, diet, exercise, overweight, which accounts for about 30% of cancers. And in, in some cases like endometrial cancer, it's estimated as about 70% of cancers. There's the virally mediated cancers, such as the human papilloma, uh, risk factor cancers, such as cervical cancer, head and neck cancer, anal, penile, that are uh, can be prevented if somebody just would take the vaccine. Uh, and unfortunately, less than 50% of people receive the HPV vaccine. And of course, that's due to risky sexual behavior. You see alcohol on the list. This is a carcinogen. Uh, we're just delivering the news here. So we've known for decades that alcohol is a carcinogen and there's been somewhat reluctance from many organizations to uh, call it out. That is not the case anymore. And um, it is to, to really be a leading an anti-cancer life, you should not be drinking. Sun exposure, my cancer was a melanoma. Wicked sunburns in particular under the age of, of 20, which was my case growing up in Europe in the summers in Greece increases your, your chances of melanoma. Uh, five sunburns up to 80% increased risk. So these are all factors that are within our control. And what we're gonna go into more depth today is stress. And, and stress actually influences a lot of these behaviors as well as, as you'll hear, has a direct impact on uh, uh, risk factors for cancer. So this is what we call the mix of six. And these are the six areas that we uh, talk about. Um, and that we've covered, as I said, in our book. Uh, 
we have highlighted them individually, but it's really important to think of them also collectively. So social support, stress management, sleep, physical activity, diet, and exposure to environmental toxins. And so often when we think about our health, we often think about a specific area and it's very siloed. So if I could just get my diet under control, everything would be all right. Or if I could just manage stress, I'd be perfect. And what we realize is that you have to look at it from the umbrella of your health. Uh, the mix of six is that umbrella. And then collectively, it has an impact. And what we're not going to be able to get into a lot of full details about this, but we'll highlight some of this uh, important research is it's not just about your lifestyle. It's not just about your weight. It's not just about feeling better. All of the mix of six influence what are called the cancer hallmarks, biological processes that need to be activated to allow that rogue cell uh, that has mutated to grow and thrive in the body and form a mass uh, that we call cancer. And each of the mix of six, um, and some more so than others, influence these key cancer hallmarks. So. Uh, again, we'll, we'll get into these uh, details, but it's not, again, just about feeling better. It's about changing your whole biology and making, as Allison said, our bodies as inhospitable to cancer growth as possible. So synergy, uh, the phenomenon where the whole is more than the sum of the parts. So like I mentioned before, when we were talking about the mix of six, it's really a collective approach. And while today we're going to be talking specifically about stress, it's really important to remember it's that collective approach to your health and forming a synergy that's positive. We all know what negative synergy is. You don't sleep well, you get up late, you skip exercising, you choose a breakfast that's not nutritious, you treat the loved ones in your life not kindly, and so on. So it's really about changing that synergistic pattern from a negative one to a positive one, so that one thing, you leap from one to the other, and everyone reinforces uh, the, the last one or the next one. So that's really the message here that, uh, that focusing on the, the whole is so important uh, to do. And that it's not about what you haven't done in the past. What you haven't done in the past stays in the past. It's really about where you are right this moment. Uh, no blame, no shame, no guilt, because you have shown up for this uh, webinar and to share this time with us. So already you're taking your first step uh, and or your hundredth step and, and doing something very positive for yourself. So social support, why we're just gonna speak a bit very briefly on this is that this is the foundation of the mix of six. And it's critical that this piece is in place before you launch into addressing some of the other areas. So often we think about uh, making a change and maybe after today you'll have thought, okay, I'm gonna make some changes in, in the area of stress management. But one of the most important things to do first is to decide how am I going to be successful, because there's nothing worse than trying to do something uh, and then and, and then failing and uh, and thinking I'm not going to I'm not going to try it again for a while. So really getting your social support in place before you step forward uh, and what that looks like we're going to talk about. And the other reason support is important is because the, the data is just overwhelming that on the flip side of support is loneliness and, and social isolation. We know that that's, that's literally toxic. And the flip side you see pictured here from some beautiful research by our colleague Susan Lukendorf at the University of Iowa, actually showing that the patients who have more social support and socially connected to their uh, friends and colleagues live longer after this diagnosis. And again, it's not just about feeling better. This is uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. One of the uh, cancer hallmarks is, 
is angiogenesis, the ability of the tumor microenvironment to grow its own vascular system to feed itself. And, and the perfect visual metaphor is, is uh, a bunch of grapes on a vine. Um, angiogenesis is, is the, the nourishment that is fed to the grapes. Uh, and of course, this is something you don't want happening in your tumor microenvironment. And there's drugs that are called anti-angiogenic drugs that actually would block off blood supply to the tumor. Here we see in this cohort of cancer patients, as social well-being goes up, this marker of angiogenesis actually goes down. So those with more social support have less activation of angiogenesis, this important cancer hallmark. So there is, as Allison's about to talk about, this more indirect effect of social support, how it can help us to be successful in each of the mix of six. But there's also this very important direct effect of, of being connected with others and how that is extremely positive down to a biological level. So before taking off with your change that you're looking to to make, uh, consider these different areas and what you will need. Um, you know, as if you're somebody who has a ca cancer diagnosis, uh, it is really critical to look at the this grouping uh, of support and figure out who you have in your community to fill these spots. So technical and informational support is somebody like a doctor or an expert in, a, in how to use your computer. Practical support is somebody who's going to drive you to appointments, somebody who will pick up your children or grandchildren for you. Listening support is somebody who is there, who shares the same values that you do, do so that the, when you're listening and, and, and sharing that you're kind of on the same, the same wavelength. Participatory support, who can you rope in to uh, sign up for meditation classes or for yoga classes? That's really critical. Uh, motivational support, who is the cheerleader who is always going to say, you can do this, you can make this change and you can come around this corner. Uh, emotional support is the person who you can share everything with and the deep, uh, difficult stuff. So you can see that this, this requires uh, not one person because this is way too much for one person to do. And whether you're a cancer patient or cancer caregiver, uh, you, you each need to have your own supports um, out there. And even if, if you're not facing a cancer diagnosis, you, we all need this kind of support at different times and to take on different th things, excuse me. Uh, so this was uh, the motto at our son's school, our, our, our eldest son's college, non satis shire, uh, I believe is how you say it. Uh, knowing is not enough. And we loved coming across this um, at his school because it really is so true. You know, and today you're gonna learn uh, about the science and about strategies. And then it's going to be about taking action that works for you. And you are you, your own best expert about what is going to fit with your own life. And so all of the suggestions, whether they're from other people that we describe or whether they're from our own personal lives, it's all just suggestions and starting points from you. There's not one thing that one has to do or one way to do it. But we just want to share a lot of different things to see to help you get to that position where you're ready to take that step uh, into action. And this, this you know, motto of knowing is not enough, uh, I, I can definitely say applies to me because being a stress researcher, I, I, I know the data. I, I, I can recite the data without all these wonderful slides that we're gonna share with you today um, you know, in, in my sleep. Uh, and even so, I was not following when it comes to the mix of six, this is the area, and I'm very pleased that, that Meg uh, is having us focus on this topic. This is the area that I fell short. And in fact, many people uh, tend to, to not truly understand the importance of managing 
stress in our lives. And melanoma, as well as other cancers, are exquisitely immunogenic. And that's why we have this, this discovery of immunotherapy and the drugs that, that I was able to take to be able to control the cancer because melanoma is controlled by the immune system. And chronic stress decreases the key components of the immune system that you need to be able to control a disease like melanoma, kidney cancer, breast cancer, and, and many others where that cancer hallmark is critical. Um, so let's get into it here. Let's get into some of, of the research on stress and, and most importantly on stress management. But before getting into the strategies, we just need to understand you know, what, what stress is. And there's often a misunderstanding between stressors and stress. So the stressor is the event and uh, the event is typically something that, that would pose challenge, may cause harm, viewed as a threat in, in your environment. Um, and how you respond to that simplistically is, is more what we'd call stress or the stress response. Now, from an acute perspective and actually evolutionarily speaking, this response, what's called the fight or flight response, our mobilization in those situations is extremely adaptive. And I would argue that, that we have evolved from ancestors who had an exquisitely sensitive and reactive stress response because those are the individuals who could sense danger and get out of danger more effectively, quickly. They were able to procreate more, et cetera. We're talking about you know, 100,000, 150,000 years ago. And, and this is a very old response that's embedded in the, in the deep part of our brain, in particular the amygdala, to be able to activate uh, this stress response. This stress response means that you are going to have an increase in heart rate and blood pressure, you're going to have a shunting of the blood from central organs to the muscles, better oxygenation of the blood. There's actually a change in the shape of, of the cornea, so you can see long distances better. There's a speeding up of blood clotting time, meaning that if you are injured, your blood's gonna clot faster. Now, where we get into trouble is that all these same things are happening with chronic stress. Uh, it's probably, you know, it could be argued that there wasn't a lot of chronic stress historically, uh, evolutionarily speaking, in our ancestors. And in those situations, it, it tended to be extreme famine, which leads to our body when you restrict calories of holding on to fat. And, and there's, you know, you, you can look at actually all of the mix of six from a very interesting evolutionary perspective, but, but stress being one of the most important. Uh, if, if you, you know, chronic stress would represent that you're living in a dangerous environment, so you never sleep deeply enough. Uh, and so all of this in, in today's world is no longer adaptive and extremely maladaptive, as, as you will see. Now, the challenge in this area of stress, and everyone kind of thinks they know what it is, and, and everyone experiences it, so everyone is an expert, uh, but it's hard to study because a lot of it is subjective in nature. Um, the ethics of animal research, we're not going to get into, but, you know, all these drugs that are making us live longer and, and some may argue better, um, are because of animal research. And, and this is something uh, that we can do in the area of stress. We can't take half of you who are watching today and chronically stress you for 10 years and see what happens to you. And we'll treat the other half of, of the audience nicely uh, and, and see what happens to you in terms of all of these different kinds of health outcomes. But in animals, and what my colleague Anil Sood, who's the senior author, he's at MD Anderson, um, did is took a, a group of, in this case, ovarian cancer, but it's been replicated in multiple cancer models, um, and chronically stressed these animals who had cancer on board, and then looked at cancer growth. Um, and we've known actually dating back to the 70s, the cancers grow uh, larger, faster when animals are exposed to even psychological stress. There's no harm and there's no deprivation and, and the, there's nothing torturous done to these animals. Uh, and it's actually a very predictable kind of stressor. They're just 
in what's called restraint stress. They can't turn around and it drives them crazy. Kind of what we do to our patients at the hospital when we stick them in an MRI machine for half an hour and tell them that they can't move, they can't breathe, and uh, they can't scratch their nose, etc. And so two hours a day out of 24 hours, uh, very predictable when it happens, the animals are put into this tube. And Dr. Sood showed over the years, you know, all the stress response and the, the stress hormones that are flooding the body, changes in the immune system. What you see here are animals in the first graph uh, and, and the tumor weight, much larger tumors you see in that second bar if they were uh, chronically stressed. And the second graph is showing spread throughout the body. So the animals who weren't stressed, actually the tumor grew, but it was confined to where the cells were injected versus the stressed animals had the tumor growing throughout their body. Why this was a landmark paper and published in Nature Medicine, and I'm spending a bit more time talking about this, is that uh, Dr. Sood was able to show that if you uh, gave propranolol to the stressed animals that you see in the bottom bar, it was as if they weren't stressed at all. And what's important to know about propranolol is it is blocking the effects of the stress hormone norepinephrine. So he was able to show with this study, and it was a series of multiple studies in this paper, that it was really norepinephrine, this stress hormone that is part of the stress response that is driving progression of disease. We subsequently showed in, in multiple different populations, both at MD Anderson as well as others, that this common response to, to cancer, uh, if it continues, in particular depressive symptoms. Those patients don't tend to live as long. We see that there's dysregulation in stress hormone uh, system, as well as being able to map this all the way down into the tumor microenvironment and look at gene uh, signaling pathways and seeing that it has to do with inflammation, immune regulation, again, some of the cancer hallmarks. So stress is, is really, simplistically getting into the tumor microenvironment and making it more hospitable to cancer growth, literally activating all the different cancer hallmarks, making the greater vascular system, decreasing immune function, allowing cells to, to become more resistant to, to cell death that should happen if they break off from the two primary uh, sites. So breast cancer cells, are not supposed to be growing in the liver or on the bone. There's processes in place that are supposed to stop that from uh, happening. Uh, so stress actually makes the tumor microenvironment more likely to thrive and survive when a cell leaves, meaning uh, starting the metastatic process. Um, and probably the worst uh, situation to be able to share with you before we get into some of the good news is that stress literally gets into the nucleus of every single cell in our body. Uh, and in this case leads to what's called telomere attrition. So you see here the chromosomes that make up all of our cells on the end of the chromosome pictorially represented here, are what are called the telomeres. And uh, the telomeres maintain the structural integrity of the chromosome. As we age, actually our telomeres shorten. That leads to what's called uh, uh, chromosomal instability. And this is actually a risk factor for a cell to mutate. Uh, and when it replicates, it, it has defects because the chromosomes uh, are, are being damaged because the telomeres get too short. So this is part of the aging process why historically speaking, um, Cancer has been a disease of more advanced age, but that unfortunately is not the case anymore. So chronic stress also leads to telomere attrition, meaning that chronic stress is, is literally speeding the aging process. And as I mentioned, chronic stress activates all of the cancer hallmarks, making the tumor microenvironment more hospitable to cancer growth. So here you have, I mean, we all think to ourselves, no stress. Uh, here you have a doctor saying stress is killing you. You need an easier job, a smaller house and a different family. If only that could be true. <laughs> we all know that that's not a solution to the issue. There are many different mind body programs. So you've heard just a little bit of the science and we're gonna 
keep kind of going back and forth with the science and strategy. Uh, and when you're thinking, we want to, when you're thinking about things to try out, we want to present you with things to do that are evidence-based, that we know work from the science so that you will have success at taking on your own stress management. So cognitive behavioral therapy, where you reframe the way that you're thinking is really the gold standard. Um, there's social support, like we said, relaxation therapy, humor. I mean, you've got on the, on the left side, you've got the more Western-based uh, practices and on the Easter, uh, you've got on the right side, you've got the Eastern based practices like yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong, uh, expressive arts, which we're going to talk about. So there's many different modalities that can be explored. And if uh, one doesn't feel right, consider uh, another. So the power of writing, we wanted to spend a moment talking about this because this is a very effective tool. It's very easy to do, and it requires no uh, commitment uh, on the part of signing up for anything. So there's journaling every day, which we know about, but where you can be really effective is with what's called expressive writing. And this is really three to four times that you would do this. You would spend 20 minutes doing it each time, and maybe let's say within 10 day period. So in that time, you take 20 minutes, you don't bother about grammar, you don't concern yourself with spelling, you write down your deepest thoughts and feelings you, that potentially you have never shared with anybody else. And you spend 20 minutes doing it, and then it's done. And you can throw that piece of paper away if you want. It's not to go back and ponder it. It's really the act of the 20 minutes of giving that time to writing these deep thoughts and feelings down that is the success of it. Uh, so this is one um, tool that if you haven't explored is a very effective tool. And what, what's quite interesting about the expressive writing paradigm is, is it's self-tailored. So, you know, you choose what to write about and, and how deep to go and how many layers of the onion you're willing to, to, to uncover. Uh, and, and ideally it's about, it could be something actually in the past. It could be in how this started, Jamie Pennebaker, um, who is at UT Austin now, uh, developed this um, and, and first experimented with, with undergrads and they were writing about a past traumatic experience. Um, so it doesn't have to be something recent. The work that we've done as well as others is having people write about their cancer experience. And we see that, that even 10 months later, there's differences between an expressive writing group and a uh, neutral writing group on things like quality of life and pain. And it's been shown to improve immune function and interestingly response to vaccinations. Um, and it is self-limited. So as Allison said, it, it's not about doing this every day. It's about doing this on a few occasions to kind of go deep for one uh, particular area. Also to consider is reflective writing. And this is really writing that would take place on a regular basis in your life that you would reflect on an event or an experience. And often if you're meditating, uh, you, let's suppose you did a, a 10 to 30 minute meditation, and then you would sit down and write for five to 10 minutes, reflecting on your meditation. Often uh, when you get a diagnosis, like a cancer diagnosis, it uh, makes you question everything in your life. And in the process, you reconnect with your core values. Uh, and this is really important to kind of write down what are my core values, you know, what this experience has, is, has opened this door and I really want to make sure that I'm living the life that I want to live right now. And reflective writing allows you to write about your core values and how best to stay on the course that you think is productive from your life. It also provides opportunities for you to identify triggers. So in your meditation, uh, you finish and you realize that you were thinking about something else uh, aside from kind of emptying your mind, then maybe that that's a whole discussion that can be had. And you can find solutions where you might not have had the space and the time to think 
uh, think of them. So reflective writing is another really effective tool uh, to use. Uh, we hear so much about gratitude now. It's on social media, it's everywhere. You know, the feeling of showing appreciation, of kindness, being thankful. And this is another tool that can be completely separate, um, but also it has the potential to go very deep if you allow it to. So if you were to spend each evening when you hop into bed, that you have a journal beside your bed and you write down three statements or moments of awe that you've experienced during the day. And what happens is that it's actually a lot harder than you think it is. Lorenzo took this challenge on a number of years ago and what he found was that it was really difficult to, uh, to start seeing the joyful moments in his life because so often we're problem solvers and we're looking for ways to solve problems that are negative and we're not focused on the, the, the tiniest things to the largest things that are really uh, positive and, and just pleasing to experience. And, and I think from the evolutionary perspective again, which is how I love to look at all of this, looking for the negative, looking for the danger, looking for the fear was adaptive. It was what allowed us to survive in, in a very dangerous world. And, and although people think we may live in a dangerous world, we as, as homo sapiens have never been in a safer, uh, conflict-free world uh, compared to, to our ancestors. So our brain is set to find the negative. And like in my job, my job isn't to, my, my job is to find what's wrong with the paper, what's wrong with an experiment. I'm always looking for the negative. So you have to really retrain our brain to see the positive. And the more that you look for it and the more that you are conscious of it, and that's what this writing down does, it allows you to be more conscious of all of it, uh, then your brain gets rewired and starts to see more positive that is actually there. That reframing of your thinking, moving from the negative to the positive. But one of the things that's challenging is that how do you remember? So this reminder actually can go, uh, can span uh, into the meditation um, realm as well, which I'll follow up on. But I find it very effective that I wear a reminder. Uh, I have three little rocks that I <laughs> that I picked up at a shop uh, during Lorenzo's cancer treatment. Uh, crystals and things that I was interested that they, they sh showed that they had healing properties. And uh, I've forgotten what each of the healing properties is now, but what it does is that it reminds me to feel grateful and to see something positive in the moment that I touch them when I carry them in my pocket, like I do. And, uh, you know, you can have a rubber band around your wrist or a bracelet. You can use rocks or crystals. You can have the special ring or the jewelry, you know, small, a sticker on your computer, but I find that I just stop seeing that. And so you have to keep moving it around. But small things to remind you to really pay attention so that you realize there is something joyful that I can find today, even if it is a really tough day. And as, as trite as it may seem to just write down three things you're grateful for, isn't there actually data to support <laughs> this exercise, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, it's really, uh, uh, it says that, um, Oh, I was going to say, um, it implies and, and talks about how uh, people are more peaceful, how people are, um, st their immune systems, I mean, it goes down to the, yeah, I think uh, the stress hormones the are lower and everything. the immune system is functioning better. Um, yeah. So again, it's not just, you know, you'll feel better, you'll notice the good things, it's going to change your biology, which is, is quite profound. And it changes, uh, it goes back to what, what they did talk about was it, it changes from that negative to that positive, right? So you are changing on the outside as well as on the inside. You are able to reframe and to look at challenging situations in a much more positive way, which means that you have the resilience to then take on the challenging situations that come your way. And that that is affecting things like your immune system.
So the good news actually, when it comes to this whole area we're talking about stress is we've never known more about the brain, the harms of stress, and then beneficial ways of, of managing stress and starting to understand why things like gratitude, mindfulness, meditation, and, and yoga can be uh, quite helpful. So, you know, I throw up three, four Time Magazine covers, you know, from over the years. And there's, of course, a huge interest in this now and, and literally, as it says, uh, a mindful uh, revolution. I'll take you through a little bit of, of the data and in particular go more in depth in, uh, in, in one of the studies that we did at MD Anderson. This was when we embarked on doing this study actually with my colleague Alejandro Traul doing Tibetan yoga. Um, I didn't know actually how few clinical trials there were on the role of yoga in cancer in particular. And this study that was published in 2004 was one of the first randomized clinical trials. What does that mean? That, that you take a group of individuals and you randomize them and, as in the flip of a coin to half of them get the yoga and half of them are in a control group of some kind. In this case, it was, it was actually just uh, weightless, meaning they had to wait until the study was over and then we offered them the yoga and, and clear benefits for sleep quality as well as some other uh, outcomes. We subsequently have done uh, and subsequent to this, a number of other studies, but this was again, one of our earlier studies that we were able to publish in one of the top uh, cancer journals. And here we had not only the weightless control group, but we also had a stretching control group. So importantly, we were able to say that it wasn't just, or we were controlling to see if it was just attention, movement, stretching. So we had uh, a middle group, as you could, we could call it, that did stretching exercises, the basic exercises that breast cancer patients are supposed to do while they're undergoing radiotherapy. So one group practiced yoga twice a week throughout radiation, six weeks, 12 sessions. The other group worked with a physical therapist twice a week, for six weeks, 12 sessions, and then we had the weightless control group. And what you see here is uh, change over time, end of treatment means end of radiation, and then one month, three month, and six month follow-up. So clearly uh, there is a benefit on this measure of ability to engage in daily activities uh, for the yoga group and better than both the stretching group as well as the usual care control group that essentially didn't get better. And these women have all just come off of uh, surgery and or chemotherapy. So uh, they're not getting better from, from the end of treatment through six months if they didn't do anything. Uh, and we see really favoring the yoga group with intermediate effect for the stretching group, but stretching was only different than usual care at the three month point. Another measure of quality of life, their report of their overall general health. To me, probably one of the most important measures this, this uh, as Allison was talking about, in some sense, the core values, ability to find meaning in the illness experience. Uh, we see is, is higher in the yoga group than it was at study entry throughout the time period where we see it decreasing over time in the other two groups. And here we're back to a biological measure of stress hormone, cortisol rhythmicity. So cortisol is a diurnal hormone. It's high in the morning, drops throughout the course of the day. We found in that kidney cancer patient, patient population, I showed you earlier that a, a disrupted slope, and in particular, a blunting of the slope predicts survival. Same has been shown in breast cancer patients, lung cancer patients, and others. Here we see a, a steeper slope, a better cortisol regulation if they were in the yoga group compared to both the other groups at the end of treatment as well as one month later. So not only are patients feeling better, uh, but they have better stress hormone regulation. Uh, an important area of research being run by my colleague, Catherine Milbury is actually delivering this, not just to the patient, but also to the primary caregiver and the patient as a dyad, because 
they of course influence each other and we can get into that later. And there's been an explosion of paper that I wrote with Suzanne Danhauer um, in, in yoga research in oncology in particular. Uh, and in a, a book that I've edited on yoga for different medical conditions, there was so much evidence on the role of yoga in oncology that we actually had two chapters, one for the studies for yoga during cancer treatment and one for when uh, treatment was over. Um, and the evidence around mind-body practices in helping cancer patients is uh, so broad and deep now that it's actually on the NCCN guidelines. So these are guidelines from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network made up of all the top cancer centers in the country, including MD Anderson. And you can see here for controlling uh, nausea, uh, a number of different interventions, including yoga, uh, including relaxation exercises, hypnosis, systematic desensitization. Similarly for fatigue, we see yoga, we see a number of different uh, cognitive behavioral strategies, supportive expressive therapies. Uh, of course, for distress management, we see a number uh, of, of mind-body practices, relaxation, meditative, meditation, creative therapies. Um, and then in the area of pain, uh, yoga is, is listed as something that should be considered. And then again, mindfulness-based stress reduction, we'll get into a bit more details on that. ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, also recommends these different practices, mind-body practices for anxiety and stress reduction, depression, mood, uh, improving uh, quality of life. So here, I've had a lot of free time this year. This may, be, this may be you over this COVID year, I don't know, but it's certainly not me. Uh, and I can, you know, there's, this is the kind of thing that becomes intimidating uh, and makes you think that you need to be able to do this kind of uh, posture uh, with little time and practice. But really, this is what it looks like. Uh, so it is very basic. Uh, I encourage people that if you haven't tried yoga, that uh, it's a really good, uh, a very, as Lorenzo is explaining, it's science-based and it has a profound effect. And if you're associated with a cancer hospital, uh, that's a great place to start to reach out and find uh, yoga classes because they will be tailored to wherever you are in your treatment or as a caregiver. And it's not about getting into the posture. It's really about uh, the connection of the mind, breath, and body, and doing things that feel good, as well as, you know, just stretching yourself a little bit more. So it's really important um, that you find a teacher that you like. And uh, here we are in, our, you know, on the floor here with a computer in front of us and we signed up for a free online class that we found in our city and that we liked and we liked the teacher. And so we started doing it twice a week during COVID for one portion of it. So it's really about finding the thing that's gonna work for you. And if you've tried yoga before and it hasn't felt right, uh, try and see if you can find a new teacher because it really does matter the teacher and whether or not you are being challenged. One of the things I'm taking a yoga um, teacher cert certification right now. And I've had a few injuries over the course of the last month. And I have watched- Not from the yoga, No, course. no, not from the yoga. Uh, and I've watched my fellow classmates do yoga on Zoom because the whole course is on Zoom. And what I see is that there is such a wide variety of ability to simply bend right or to bend left. And it was so um, reassuring that I didn't have to be a super superstar in getting into the position so and and yoga is really about the process as is any of these mind body practices and if yoga is not your thing even though you've tried a number of classes as we had on that on that prior slide there's lots of other uh, mind, breath, body practices, Tai Chi, Qigong, uh, that, that do have, again, uh, a deep evidence base. 
I love this uh, picture because it's a reminder to me and I need them all the time. So this is a yo yoga master named Vanda Scaravelli, who's Lorenzo's grandmother, Italian grandmother. And she lost her husband in her 40s and decided to take up yoga. And um, in this picture was taken when she was in her 80s. And what the reminder is for me is not that I'm ever going to get into that position, that posture, and I don't need to. But what I absolutely can have in my own practice is that calm uh, that I see when I look at her in this position. And I know that I can have that and I can practice yoga in one form or another for the rest of my life. So another area of evidence is, is, let's call it more seated based meditations. And one program that's probably been researched the most is what's called MBSR, Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction. Uh, this is uh, developed by John Kabat-Zinn. It's an eight week program, two hours a week with typically one weekend workshop, although it's been researched in different uh, iterations, but it is, it is uh, not that long. Uh, and, and this was a, a seminal paper actually showing prior research showing change in, in many different outcomes, including brain function. But this was actually change in brain anatomy, neuroanatomy, where there's an increase in the size of the hippocampus. This is the uh, memory and, and uh, memory in particular in learning center of our brain where there's actually an increase so like we go to the gym to to get our heart healthy to build muscles through these types of meditation practices you can actually increase the size of in this case the hippocampus there was a shrinking of the amygdala the negative emotion processing center of the brain and in oncology in particular there's been and i'm just going to flash up these different studies so many different studies and large studies, and you can see here published in, in top cancer journal, showing the benefits of these types of uh, even short programs that, that only last eight weeks. And when we think about, you know, what Allison did at the beginning was, you know, one and a half minutes, these are studies of, of what were called uh, relaxation response studies. So we're talking about five minutes of relaxation, just extending a little bit further what Allison did at the beginning. And it actually changes the way our genes behave. Now, you know, two hours later, you probably, it's going to go back to some degree if you continue to lead a uh, chaotic, stress filled life. Uh, but imagine if you put yourself in the state every day for a brief period of time, and you do that week after week, month after month, then some of these changes actually will become permanent. And again, the cancer hallmarks are, uh, let's say, influenced in a, in a beneficial way. And we know this from a lot of research in terms of these types of practices, improving immune function, decreasing stress hormones, decreasing angiogenesis, actually a study showing that the, an eight-week MBSR kind of program slowed down telomere attrition. So, you know, some could say that it was slowing the aging process. This is uh, a woman named Molly who uh, sat with us for our book and whose story is shared, uh, who was diagnosed 20 years ago with a glioblastoma multiform, which is an incredibly diff difficult cancer to contend with. And after her conventional care, she realized that she needed to add more to her plate in order to really be able to uh, thrive. And so she took a, a, a course at her cancer center, uh, focusing on mind body health. And she developed a whole way of using uh, like we talked about with the gratitude, sticky notes to reframe the way she was thinking. Her father put them around the house. You are not the, your illness. Find, you know, what has, is positive in this moment in your life? Uh, you know, you contribute all kinds of different things. She uses imagery and she established a practice that she does every single day. So she uses imagery of the fish swimming from Georgian Bay, which is behind us in that picture into her body, 
eating the cancer cells and swimming out importantly. Uh, she developed a yoga, a yoga practice. She has a very strong faith. So all these things are really important uh, about creating a, a habit and a routine for your mind-body practice. That's a really important component and looking at your day and thinking, where can I put this in? Uh, discussing it with your support team or your support person and moving forward. Uh, this is a picture of how we did it when we were when our kids were younger meditating with in our family we have two two of our three children are here uh and you know now we have a teenage daughter at home and what we do is the headspace on netflix and we watch it as a family where you have a talk about the different kind of meditation you're learning and then we do 10 minute meditation together as a family each day and we're finding that really effective right now because it is such a difficult time with covid so there are so many different resources and you don't just need to do this by yourself and there's lots of great resources online things like headspace calm. Uh, there's just a multiple of different options. Uh, it often looks like this. Uh, you would ideally like it to look like it did in the picture before, but often this is where you're starting when you're starting with kids, and that's okay. Uh, meditation moments. We talked about that. We did one in the beginning, uh, how important it is and how easy it is to just take yourself down off of a ledge or away from a uh, emotion that you are feeling. Every time you, hand, you wash your hands, you focus on the action of washing your hands, the feeling of washing your hands, and just be very present with that. At a red light, you take those deep diaphragmatic breaths. Uh, every time you come to a stoplight. So it's really, and using those tools that you have with you, like the, I use a little, the three little rocks or a ring or a, a band around your wrist to remind you to do it so that it becomes a habit. And this is a wonderful quote from uh, a woman who was in the study that Lorenzo did at MD Anderson called Comp Life, who had stage three breast cancer. And through her work in so, so many of the areas of anti-cancer living that, and in particularly reflective about meditation, that through meditation and deep right relaxation, that she was able to get the answers flowing and that she had never invested any time in herself for 24 years, raising kids, working jobs, and that she put some time into herself and it unlocked uh, all the things that she had been felt in her life had been trapped inside her. So it was very moving uh, and a, a description of what meditation can do for you. And, you know, when it comes to the issue of synergy, you know, when, when we give talks, you know, and with the cancer patients that Allison described there in the study, they really want to know, you know, what's the diet I should eat? What's the exercise I should do? Um, and, and they tend to forget about the stress component. Now, having all the support that we provided within the clinical trial meant that they could go deep into this area. And, and it's really profound, some of the, the stories that, that are shared in our book and how important, and I hypothesize that would be the case, how important this area was. But here's actually a study showing that people who are given, and this is a very controlled feeding environment, people who are given a uh, healthy meal, if they are experiencing chronic stress, their bodily's response, and in this case, an inflammatory marker, was uh, similar to somebody who uh, didn't have any stress and were eating an unhealthy meal. So that doesn't mean that if you're chronically stressed, there's no point in even trying to eat healthy food. What it's saying is that if you're chronically stressed and feeding your body good food, the benefits of all of that investment in the food are gonna be diminished because you're constantly flooding your body with these stress hormones. And similarly, really beautiful study that tracked 200 women over the course of a year and measured their stressful events and how much telomere attrition they had. And there was a clear relationship between how much stress you had and your telomeres getting shorter across the course of the year. But those who engaged in healthy exercise, a healthy diet and healthy sleep patterns had no telomere attrition relative to their counterparts, regardless of how much stress they had. Uh, so these 
factors that we, we call the mix of six are critical. And we're not gonna get into the area of obesity, uh, but all of the mix of six and in particular stress are directly linked with obesity. And I mentioned at the beginning that, you know, part of this stress response and flooding the body and stress hormones is typically in response to something that's happening outside in your environment. And evolutionarily speaking, that was potentially famine or danger, and it'd be hard to, to, to forage and hunt. Uh, so chronic stress actually leads to an inability to lose weight. So you're restricting calories, you're chronically stressed, you're worried about all these things, uh, and, and it's all going to be counteracted. So just in closing, it's about creating that synergy uh, that's positive that, and creating positive contagion. So if you take a step forward in the area of stress, uh, today that that is going to lead to more and more changes around the mix of six so uh, we encourage you to uh, to to look for that and like like all of this it's a practice and so the more you practice the better you get at it so we're interested to know how you're going to start anti-cancer living today what's your next step going to be Thank you uh, all for coming today. All right, so before we move to the Q&A, um, thank you so much, first of all, uh, to Dr. Cohen and to Allison for today's presentation. I know we're, we've gone over by a few minutes. Um, before we move to q and I just wanna remind everyone, if you haven't uh, done so already, we highly, highly, highly recommend uh, signing up for the course. It is free, it is self-paced. Um, so if you just go to our uh, URL, www.anticancerlifestyle.org, you can sign up for the course there. Um, and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pass. So Erica is gonna be, she's been moderating all the questions and she is ready to ask you a bunch of questions. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Erica. And we're gonna, go, stop, sorry, we're gonna stop sharing the screen so that we can see, see you close up. Um, Okay, there we go. Hi, everybody. I'll be hosting the Q&A portion. We had so many wonderful questions come in, continue to come in. So thank you for, for your participation in this. Um, I'll start with one question that I'm sure it's on many people's minds. How do I deal, how do I help my stress level with MRI appointments, also known as scanxiety? Scanxiety. Well, so there's two sides of scanxiety, of course. One is the unknown, right? The the you know the waiting and 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 then the other is the acute situation. So you know I, I can help you deal with the acute issue of you know if you're claustrophobic and that kind of thing. Uh, that one's much easier to to manage, and it's a lot of what what we talked about. Uh, there's there's some MRI and CT scan uh, machines that allow you to have yeah. fed, headphones on, um, and and if they don't, then you you engage that diaphragmatic breathing again. The more you practice this type of thing ahead of time, the easier it is to do it in the stressful moment in and in, in that stressful situation. Um, the other one, the anxiety, you know, I think I have an easier time, perhaps even than Allison in dealing with this, even with myself. I mean, I, I don't, I don't worry about things until somebody tells me oh, to worry, yeah. you know? So, I mean, I go for scans now on a regular basis and, you know, stage three melanoma is a pretty aggressive cancer, but in between, I don't worry about it because, if I, do. if I do, if I do find out that, you know, there's something in my body that's there and shouldn't be there and is growing, um, then I'll deal with it then. And the, the problem is, is that by, by thinking, you know, so one of the evolutionary things that's amazing about humans compared to anyone else on any other species on the planet is this free frontal, prefrontal cortex, right? It allows us to think, it allows us to plan, but it allows us also to create stressful events that haven't even happened yet. And the problem is that when you think about something negative in the future, one, it could allow you to plan and there is importance in planning and being ready for something. But the body actually doesn't know that different from experiencing the event for real 
reliving it from the past or thinking about it in the future, even though it hasn't happened, you'll actually still have that stress response. Now, thinking about a recurrence of disease is going to create less of a stress response than if you're actually told that horrendous news. But you're still living that, that kind of stress response. So to the degree that, you know, and again, this gets back to Eastern philosophy and all of this, living in the moment is the most calming way to live because the negative things and the traumas in the past aren't there, the potential negative things that are going to be there because we all experience stressors in our life that are going to happen uh, aren't there at the moment. And when they're there, you'll be resilient and be able to respond to them because you'll have practiced all these wonderful tools and others that we've shared with you today. A couple more questions. We will be wrapping in a few minutes, right around 12.15. Um, is there a good way to measure stress and check in with yourself? Sometimes stress hits you and you don't even realize you were under the stress to begin with. Well, scientifically, is the, do you think the question is, or? Uh, I think it's um, about how, is there a way to check in with yourself to see if your stress levels are activated or not? I, uh, you know, so scientifically, I'll let Lorenzo uh, answer that, but just, even doing the three breaths that we did at the beginning of the session today, uh, you feel no matter where you are on what you think is your stress index, it takes you down. And in order to really realize whether or not you have that low burn of stress mm -hmm. happening in your life continually, you actually have to do something to just take the edge off to be able to really evaluate. And what, uh, what we found in, in talking to people and in, in, in the, the strategies that we've recommended is that by doing that, by just taking the smallest of steps, it allows you to step back literally from your stress and evaluate it and then decide what action do I need to take to, to further decrease it so that then I can, uh, you know, find a practice that's going to be more healthy as well as reflect more on how I'm living my life daily. And then that's a benefit of, of the reflective writing after a, a meditation, even if it's a brief one, because then you're able to, to kind of put in perspective, where were you to begin with? Where are you now? And, and you can even do it as an assessment, you know, rate your stress level right. before the five minute practice and then after. And, and it is very consistent to hear from people after they do even like a, a 20 minute relaxation uh, they say, I had no idea how stressed I was. Uh, so you have to kind of move away from the stress state to realize how stressed you actually are. And it's really important. I think uh, I mentioned in when we just did a little sort of teaser uh, for our talk today about how uh, I was really struggling coping with my stress after Lorenzo's diagnosis. And we took on a course together uh, because I needed to be accountable to myself and to Lorenzo. And we learned uh, mindfulness-based stress uh, reduction training. And it was an eight week course. We went once a week together and then we meditated at home. And it really showed me over the course of that eight weeks where I was and where I wanted to go. And you know, people, people think they don't have time. Uh, but as one of, one of my grandmother's uh, yoga uh, teacher disciples said, you don't have time not to have time. Uh, so this just, it, it, it needs to get prioritized in our lives. And in fact, you find out that you have more time if you manage your stress better, you're more efficient with your time, you're more engaged with everything that you do. And speaking of the MBSR course, we have a few questions on where people can take a course such as that. Well, you can just Google that in, uh, and it will come up. You know, we have practitioner that we did our course with here, Mickey Fine, who's amazing out of Houston. I don't know whether she's offering it online. Uh, I think she is. And so she's an excellent practitioner with many years of experience. And it was such a, a transformative experience to take it. But this, these are the kinds of resources that through your cancer center, through your doctor's office, Googling online, but making sure that you have a certified practitioner uh, to take the course yeah, and on. And MBSR does have a formal certification yeah. 
process and program. Uh, it's manualized, so it's it's secularized. Um, and I, I would think that actually most major cities in the United States uh, offer MBSR. And now, you know, if if there could be a positive out of out of COVID, uh, all of these programs are now available online from the comfort of your living room. But a good place to start is that Netflix um, Headspace. Uh, program because it teaches you about different kinds of meditation so that you can sort of see what you're uh, you're heading towards. Yeah. That's a great program. I watch it myself. Um, I guess one more question to leave us today is what are some ways to stay consistent? Do you have any suggestions on how to tackle these changes to make long-term behavior like stress management to stick? Well, the one thing that we always say is that you need to choose something that you're going to do every day. Right, so the first commitment is that you look at the things that are in, in front of you that uh, you have explored or that you've heard about today, and that you think, what is something that I think I can do? And then you have your support team, which is critical, because otherwise, you know, if I had gone to the course without Lorenzo, I might not have meditated every day, right? But I had him and we would say, okay, what time are we going to meditate? And we actually, I, you know, was accountable to somebody. So it's really critical that you put that piece into play before you, you step forward so that you will be successful. And routine is critical. You know, I had injured my ankle and I wasn't able to walk every morning and that throws you, you know, throws everything off up kilter. So it's really important that you, you know, talk about it with your person who is your support person and say, well, when, when are you going to do it? When am I going to do it? Okay. And then you commit and you remain accountable to each other. And so whether that's somebody in your house or outside, so routine and habit is really. And schedule it. I mean, yeah. you have, you have yeah. to schedule this into your day, just like you schedule everything else and you schedule eating into your day. You know, the problem is you can't multitask this no. one, like other areas of the mix of six you shouldn't multitask eating or exercise but technically you can this one you can't and you need to put it into your schedule and you need to honor that time block whether it's 10 minutes 30 minutes 60 minutes uh and and as allison was saying start at a realistic thing that you think you'll be able to be successful if that's five minutes once a week you know, that's fine. That's the starting place. And then you just expand it from there. And, and you're honoring yourself by doing this um, and, and just making it a priority in your life. Speaking of eating, I think it's time for us to all break for a healthy snack. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohen and Allison for joining us today. This has been a fantastic learning experience for us all. All our attendees, thank you for joining us today. Please visit anticancerlifestyle.org if you're interested to learn more about our program and course. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, Thanks so much.